Ever since the creation of Mario by Shigeru Miyamoto back in the early 1980s, Nintendo has produced some of the best single-player experiences ever starring their franchise character. These titles have been considered revolutionary in the video game industry, and Mario is still thriving today with the recent release of the smash hit Super Mario Odyssey. However, Mario's entire history hasn't been entirely perfect, and there are a few games in the franchise Nintendo hopes will never see the light of day again. My name is Copycat, and welcome to the Top 10 Worst Mario Games of All Time. Number 10, Yoshi's Story. If many of you grew up owning an N64, then there's a good chance you ended up playing this extremely strange game. Now, at the time that this Mario-related game was released, it was seen as extremely advanced as no one had ever seen graphics in a game like that before, and many fans were excited about the idea of having a real main game franchise for Yoshi. However, what was produced turned out to be a game that was way too easy, and needed only about an hour to be beaten. The premise of the game is where it really falters, as instead of the traditional platforming scrollers like Yoshi's Island, Nintendo instead created an endless world where the only way to complete the level is to eat exactly 30 fruits scattered throughout it. As a young kid, I found this very boring and repetitive, and never really found any interest in replaying the game after I'd beat it. Some people may disagree with Yoshi's story being on this list, but I feel it belongs here solely due to the fact that it has almost no replay value, especially compared to the masterpiece Mario game that was released at that time, Super Mario 64. Number 9, Paper Mario Sticker Star. Even though this game isn't completely terrible, it definitely deserves a spot on this list as it was a major misstep for die-hard fans of the Paper Mario series. Instead of the previous formula of having party members and achieving abilities that will help you in battle, Nintendo opted to use stickers that you can easily find throughout the Mushroom Kingdom. These stickers are used in battle as your abilities, or are needed to solve environmental puzzles. The way these stickers are laid out seemingly everywhere makes the enjoyment of finding new ones diminish quickly, and they are so abundant that there's really no punishment for using as many as you want in battle. To top it all off, this game is one of the most annoying opening scenes in any Mario title, as you're given the meaningless task to find dozens of hidden toads. This mission doesn't really fit into the narrative at all, or really work as a tutorial in any way or fashion. I think for Paper Mario's first handheld adventure, fans definitely expected a lot more from this game. Number 8, Mario Tennis Ultra Smash. Over the years, Nintendo has established itself as a company that produces the best multiplayer games, especially their sports games like Mario Golf, Mario Kart, and their party games like Mario Party and Super Smash Bros. However, not every one of those games are a success with fans, especially Mario Tennis Ultra Smash. One huge complaint a lot of people have about the game is that there is no tutorial mode, meaning that for the majority of it, you have to learn yourself how to return those incredibly hard ultimate smashes. This isn't the only terrible thing about it. It also has a lack of game modes as there's only one real single player story option, and that's in the knockout challenge, where you have to defeat 15 straight opponents with little or no reward at its end. There are other smaller modes like Mega Battle, where characters can take mushrooms to become gigantic, Standard Tennis that removes all mushrooms, and Classic Tennis that removes all items. Although it just wasn't worth it as when it was released it had a steep price tag of $60 American. Number 7, Mario Party Advanced. Probably the weirdest thing about this Mario Party game for the Game Boy Advance is that it ditches its usual multiplayer formula for a more single player oriented experience. Also, instead of collecting the most amount of stars to win the game, the main objective is to stay alive as long as you possibly can while collecting gadgets that will unlock collectibles outside of the main game. Winning minigames or landing on green spaces gives you mushrooms that you can exchange for extra turns. However, what makes this game a really big disappointment is how bland and boring the minigames are, and the absence of a multiplayer mode diminishes its replay value greatly. After learning everything that's wrong with this game, it makes sense why I had never heard of this weird Mario Party title. Number 6, Mario Bros. Atari. Before Super Mario Bros. was ever released on the NES, the franchise actually made its debut in arcades in the form of the classic Versus minigame that's since appeared in several titles as a bonus. The game became so popular that Atari and Nintendo saw an opportunity to bring Mario into people's homes. The problem was at that time the Atari 2600 was extremely difficult to code for, and what resulted was a game that looked and felt nowhere close to its original. Thankfully for Nintendo in just a few short years they would release their home system, the NES, with the original Super Mario Bros. game taking the video game industry by storm. Number 5, Mario's Time Machine. 
In the early 1990s, Nintendo allowed a few third-party developers the opportunity to use Mario Bros. characters to create a series of educational video games. I couldn't imagine being a kid on Christmas opening up this brand new Mario game only to be disappointed to find out the entire game is basically a history lesson. The plot of the game revolves around returning significant historical artifacts, that were stolen by Bowser of course, back to their own time periods or else history would change forever. One major problem with this game is that if you return an item to the wrong time period, or in the wrong place in that period, then you'll have to replay that level over again while always going through the same boring repetitive minigame over and over and over. There are some clues that help you figure out where each item belongs, but most of these are found by completing a historical quiz that seems way too hard for any young kid to figure out. If I received this game back in the day when I was a young boy, then I would have been extremely disappointed as it's just not what you expect from a Mario title. Number 4, Mario is Missing Another early 90s educational game. However, this one revolves around geography while Luigi solves different puzzles in different global locations in order to find his brother Mario. The game starts off like any other Mario game, but as soon as you go down that first warp pipe and come up in New York City, you know something's wrong. Instead of platforming, Luigi must find stolen items from certain landmarks and when you're fighting the Koopas, they can't even deal damage to you. This game only ranks worse than Mario's Time Machine because it's way more confusing as the clues are completely ambiguous and Yoshi only appears to take you to different geographical locations. Nintendo would eventually learn their lesson about these educational games and nowadays is way more protective about their Mario IP. Number 3, Mario Teaches Typing. The final Mario made educational game that makes this list is one that's aimed to teach kids how to type on the computer. No matter how boring this game is, I guess it does serve its purpose, although in a very gimmicky way, to get kids how to learn to use the computer. Of course, nowadays kids know how to use the computer before they can even fully talk, so games like this would be completely obsolete. Number 2, Mario Clash. Probably Nintendo's biggest console failure of all time is the Virtual Boy that was marketed as the first system that could play 3D games. The biggest problems with the Virtual Boy was that the images for the games were displayed in red monochrome, the quality of the games were absolutely horrible, and the system was way overpriced at $185 back in 1995. Mario Clash is one of 22 games that was ever released for the system, and its gameplay was very different than the original trilogy of games. The title was more of a survival arcade game with the objective of clearing each stage of enemies before the time runs out. There's not much else to do in this incredibly boring and out of place Mario game, and the red hue from the Virtual Boy's graphics gives you a huge headache after a while. Number 1, Hotel Mario. Back in the early 1990s, Nintendo and Sony almost created a super system that would have been called the SNES CD. This would have been an add-on to the Super Nintendo and would have allowed Sony to create their own games which eventually would turn into the PlayStation. The catch was that Sony owned 100% of the format that would be used called the Super Disc, meaning that they also controlled 100% of the software licensing. Nintendo was so mad that they were unwilling to cooperate a share of this format that they dropped Sony and hired their main competitor, Philips. What resulted from this pairing is what is being hailed as the worst video game system of all time, the Philips CDI. Philips was given permission to create games using any Nintendo characters they wanted and decided to create three horrible Zelda games and the worst Mario game of all time, Hotel Mario. This game has one of the worst opening cinematics of any video game ever, and the voice acting and animations are horrendous. I hope she made lots of spaghetti! Luigi, look! It's from Bowser! Dear pesky plumbers, the Koopalings and I have taken over the Mushroom Kingdom! The fact that Mario and Luigi actually talk in full sentences goes against everything we know about Nintendo games. For some reason, the plot revolves around Bowser capturing the princess and hiding her in one of his seven hotels. Now, when starting off, you think this will just end up being another Mario platforming game, but quickly you realize this has very little to do with those titles. The only objective is to check every room while closing the doors behind you, avoiding enemies along the way. That's literally it. This awful gameplay combined with the terrible CDI controller and the enormous lag it had affecting gameplay made Hotel Mario almost unplayable. Let's just be thankful that Part 2, Super Mario's Wacky World, was cancelled before any more damage could be done to Mario's good name. Alright, so that's going to be it for today's video guys. I really hope you did enjoy this one. If you did, please leave a like, comment below on what you think about it, and of course, subscribe to my channel. I hope you all have a good day and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.